the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, the path to immortality. Maitreya Yagnavalkya said to his wife one day, The time has come for me to go forth from the worldly life. Come, my dear, let me divide my property between you and Katyani. Maitreya, my lord, if I could get all the wealth in the world, would it help me to go beyond death? Yagnavalkya, not at all. You would live and die like any other rich person. No one can buy immortality with money. My tray. Of what use, then, are money and material possessions to me? Please tell me, my lord, of the way that leads to immortality. Yagnavalkya, you have always been dear to me, my tray, and I love you even more now that you have asked me about immortality. Sit here by my side, and reflect deeply on what I say. A wife loves her husband not for his own sake, dear, but because the self lives in him. A husband loves his wife not for her own sake, dear, but because the self lives in her. Children are loved not for their own sake, but because the self lives in them. Wealth is loved not for its own sake, but because the self lives in it. Brahmins are loved not for their own sake, but because the self lives in them. Kshatriyas are loved not for their own sake, but because the self lives in them. The universe is loved not for its own sake, but because the self lives in it. The gods are loved not for their own sake, but because the self lives in them. Creatures are loved not for their own sake, but because the self lives in them. Everything is loved, not for its own sake, but because the self lives in it. This self has to be realized. Hear about this self and meditate upon him, my tray. When you hear about the self, meditate upon the self, and finally realize the self, you come to understand everything in life. For Brahmins confuse those who regard them as separate from the self. Kshatriyas confuse those who regard them as separate from the self. The universe confuses those who regard it as separate from the self. Gods and creatures confuse those who regard them as separate from the self. Everything confuses those who regard things as separate from the self. Brahmins, Kshatriyas, creatures, the universe, the gods, everything. These are the self. No one can understand the sounds of a drum without understanding both drum and drummer, nor the sounds of a conch without understanding both the conch and its blower, nor the sounds of a vena without understanding both vena and musician. As clouds of smoke arise from a fire laid with damp fuel, even so from the Supreme have issued forth all the Vedas, history, arts, sciences, poetry, aphorisms, and commentaries. All these are the breath of the Supreme. As there can be no water without the sea, no touch without the skin, no smell without the nose, no taste without the tongue, no form without the eye, no sound without the ear, no thought without the mind, no wisdom without the heart, no work without hands, no walking without feet, no scriptures without the word, so there can be nothing without the self. As a lump of salt thrown in water dissolves and cannot be taken out again, though wherever we taste the water it is salty, even so, beloved, the separate self dissolves in the sea of pure consciousness, infinite and immortal. Separateness arises from identifying the self with the body, which is made up of the elements. When this physical identification dissolves, there can be no more separate self. This is what I want to tell you, beloved. My tray. I am bewildered, blessed one, when you say there is then no separate self. Yagnavalkya. Reflect 
on what I have said, beloved, and you will not be confused. As long as there is separateness, one sees another as separate from oneself, hears another as separate from oneself, smells another as separate from oneself, speaks to another as separate from oneself, thinks of another as separate from oneself, knows another as separate from oneself. But when the self is realized as the indivisible unity of life, who can be seen by whom, who can be heard by whom, who can be smelled by whom, who can be spoken to by whom, who can be thought of by whom, who can be known by whom, my tray, my beloved, how can the knower ever be known? King Janaka of Vidya once performed a lavish sacrifice and distributed many gifts. Many wise men from Kuru and Panchala attended the ceremony, and Janaka wanted to know who was the wisest among them. So he drove a thousand cows into a pen, and between the horns of each cow he fastened ten gold coins. Then he said, Venerable Brahmins, these cows are for the wisest one among you. Let him take them away. None of the other Brahmins dared to speak, but Yagnavalkya said to his pupil Samashrava, Son, you can drive these cows home. Hero of seers, his pupil exclaimed joyfully, and he drove them home. The other Brahmins were furious. How presumptuous they shouted. And Ashvala, the royal priest, asked, Yagnavalkya, do you really believe you are the wisest of those assembled here? Yagnavalkya replied, I salute the wisest, but I want those cows. Then Gargi, daughter of Vachaknu, said, Venerable Brahmins, I shall ask Yagnavalkya only two questions. If he answers them well, no one here can defeat him in a spiritual debate. Ask, Gargi, the sage replied. Yagnavalkya, as a warrior from Kashi or Videha arises with bow and arrow to fell his opponent, I rise to fell you with two questions. Ask them, Gargi. That which is above heaven and below the earth, which is also between heaven and earth, which is the same through past, present, and future, in what is that woven warp and woof? Tell me, Yagnavakya. Yagnavakya. That which is above heaven and below earth, which is also between heaven and earth, which is the same through the past, present, and future, that is woven, warp, and woof in space. Gargi. My first question is answered well. Now for my second question. Ask, Gargi. In what is space itself woven, warp and woof? Tell me, Yagnavalkya. Yagnavalkya. The sages call it Akshara, the imperishable. It is neither big nor small, neither long nor short, neither hot nor cold, neither bright nor dark, neither air nor space. It is without attachment, without taste, smell, or touch, without eyes, ears, tongue, mouth, breath, or mind, without movement, without limitation, without inside or outside. It consumes nothing, and nothing consumes it. In perfect accord with the will of the imperishable, sun and moon make their orbits, heaven and earth remain in place, moments, hours, days, nights, fortnights, months, and seasons, become years. Rivers starting from the snow-clad mountains flow east and west, north and south to the sea. Without knowing the imperishable Gargi, whoever performs rites and ceremonies and undergoes austerities, even for many years, reaps little benefit, because rites, ceremonies, and austerities are all perishable. Whosoever dies without knowing the imperishable dies in a pitiable state. But those who know the imperishable attain immortality when the body is shed at death. 
The imperishable is the seer, Gargi, though unseen. The hearer, though unheard. The thinker, though unthought. The knower, though unknown. Nothing other than the imperishable can see, hear, think, or know. It is in the imperishable that space is woven, warp, and woof. Gargi Venerable Brahmins, count yourselves fortunate if you get away with merely paying this man homage. No one can defeat Yagnavalkya in debate about Brahman. With these words, Gargi ended her questions. Yagnavalkya came to Janaka, king of Videya, saying to himself, I will not talk today. But earlier, while they were discussing the fire ceremony, Yagnavalkya had promised him any boon he wanted. Now the king asked the sage permission to question him. Janaka, Yagnavalkya, what is the light of man? Yagnavalkya, the sun is our light, for by that light we sit, work, go out, and come back. Janaka, when the sun sets, what is the light of man? Yagnavalkya, the moon is our light, for by that light we sit, work, go out, and come back. Janaka, when the sun sets, Yagnavalkya, and the moon sets, what is the light of man? Yagnavalkya, fire is our light, for by that we sit, work, go out, and come back. Janaka, when the sun sets, Yagnavalkya, and the moon sets, and the fire goes out, what is the light of man? Yagnavalkya. Then speech is our light, for by that we sit, work, go out, and come back, even though we cannot see our own hand in the dark. We can hear what is said and move toward the person speaking. Janaka. When the sun sets, Yagnavakya, and the moon sets, and the fire goes out, and no one speaks, what is the light of man? Yagnavakya, the self indeed is the light of man, your majesty, for by that we sit, work, go out, and come back. Janaka, who is that self? Yagnavakya, the self, pure awareness, shines as the light within the heart surrounded by the senses. Only seeming to think, seeming to move, the self neither sleeps, nor wakes, nor dreams. When the self takes on a body, he seems to assume the body's frailties and limitations. But when he sheds the body at the time of death, the self leaves all these behind. The human being has two states of consciousness, one in this world, the other in the next. But there is a third state between them, not unlike the world of dreams, in which we are aware of both worlds, with their sorrows and joys. When a person dies, it is only the physical body that dies. That person lives on in a non-physical body, which carries the impressions of his past life. It is these impressions that determine his next life. In this intermediate state, he makes and dissolves impressions by the light of the self. In that third state of consciousness, there are no chariots, no horses drawing them or roads on which to travel, but he makes up his own chariots, horses, and roads. In that state, there are no joys or pleasures, but he makes up his own joys and pleasures. In that state there are no lotus ponds, no lakes, no rivers, but he makes up his own lotus ponds, lakes, and rivers. It is he who makes up all these from the impressions of his past or waking life. It is said of these states of consciousness that in the dreaming state when one is sleeping, the shining self who never dreams who is ever awake, watches by his own light the dreams woven out of past deeds and present desires. In the dreaming state, when one is sleeping, 
The shining self keeps the body alive with the vital force of prana and wanders wherever he wills. In the dreaming state, when one is sleeping, the shining self assumes many forms, eats with friends, indulges in sex, sees fearsome spectacles. But he is not affected by anything, because he is detached and free. And after wandering here and there in the state of dreaming, enjoying pleasures and seeing good and evil, he returns to the state from which he began. As a great fish swims between the banks of a river as it likes, so does the shining self move between the states of dreaming and waking. As an eagle, weary after soaring in the sky, folds its wings and flies down to rest in its nest, so does the shining self enter the state of dreamless sleep where one is freed from all desires. The self is free from desire, free from evil, free from fear. As a man in the arms of his beloved is not aware of what is without and what is within, so a person in union with the self is not aware of what is without and what is within, for in that unitive state all desires find their perfect fulfillment. There is no other desire that needs to be fulfilled, and one goes beyond sorrow. In that unitive state, there is neither father nor mother, neither worlds nor gods, nor even scriptures. In that state, there is neither thief nor slayer, neither low caste nor high, neither monk nor ascetic. The self is beyond good and evil, beyond all the suffering of the human heart. In that unitive state, one sees without seeing, for there is nothing separate from him, smells without smelling, for there is nothing separate from him, tastes without tasting, for there is nothing separate from him, speaks without speaking, for there is nothing separate from him, hears without hearing, for there is nothing separate from him, touches without touching, for there is nothing separate from him, thinks without thinking, for there is nothing separate from him, knows without knowing, for there is nothing separate from him. Where there is separateness, one sees another, smells another, tastes another, speaks to another, hears another, touches another, thinks of another, knows another. But where there is unity, one without a second, that is the world of Brahman. This is the supreme goal of life, the supreme treasure, the supreme joy. Those who do not seek the supreme goal live on but a fraction of this joy. Janaka, I give you another thousand cows. Please teach me more of the way to self-realization. Yagnavakya as a heavily laden cart creaks as it moves along, the body groans under its burden when a person is about to die. When the body grows weak through old age or illness, the self separates himself as a mango or fig or banyan fruit frees itself from the stalk and returns the way he came to begin another life. Just as when a king is expected to visit a village, the mayor and all the other officials turn out to welcome him with food and drink. All creation awaits the person who sheds his body, having realized Brahman. Here he comes, they say. Here comes Brahman himself. But the senses, while that man lies dying, gather around and mourn the self's departure as courtiers mourn when their king is about to leave. When body and mind grow weak, the self gathers in all the powers of life and descends with them into the heart. As prana leaves the eye, it ceases to see. He is becoming one, say the wise. He does not see. He is becoming one. He no longer hears. He is becoming one. He no longer speaks or tastes or smells or thinks or knows. By the light of the heart, the self leaves the body by one of its gates, and when he leaves, prana follows, and with it, 
all the vital powers of the body. He who is dying merges in consciousness and thus consciousness accompanies him when he departs along with the impressions of all that he has done, experienced and known. As a caterpillar having come to the end of one blade of grass draws itself together and reaches out for the next, so the self having come to the end of one life and dispelled all ignorance, gathers in his faculties and reaches out from the old body to a new. As a goldsmith fashions an old ornament into a new and more beautiful one, so the self, having reached the end of the last life and dispelled all ignorance, makes for himself a new, more beautiful shape like that of the devas or other celestial beings. The self is indeed a Brahman, but through ignorance people identify it with intellect, mind, senses, passions, and the elements of earth, water, air, space, and fire. This is why the self is said to consist of this and that, and appears to be everything. As a person acts, so he becomes in life. Those who do good become good. Those who do harm become bad. Good deeds make one pure. Bad deeds make one impure. So, we are said to be what our desire is. As our desire is, so is our will. As our will is, so are our acts. As we act, so we become. We live in accordance with our deep, driving desire. It is this desire at the time of death that determines what our next life is to be. We will come back to earth to work out the satisfaction of that desire. But not those who are free from desire. They are free because all their desires have found fulfillment in the self. They do not die like the others, but realizing Brahman, they merge in Brahman. So it is said, when all the desires that surge in the heart are renounced, the mortal becomes immortal. When all the knots that strangle the heart are loosened, the mortal becomes immortal. Here, in this very life, as the skin of a snake is sloughed onto an anthill, so does the mortal body fall. But the self, freed from the body, merges in Brahman, infinite life, eternal light. Janaka, I give you another thousand cows. Please, teach me more of the way to self-realization. Yagnavalkya Those who realize the self enter into the peace that brings complete self-control and perfect patience. They see themselves in everyone and everyone in themselves. Evil cannot overcome them because they overcome all evil. Sin cannot consume them because they consume all sin. Free from evil, free from sin and doubt, they live in the kingdom of Brahman. Your Majesty, this kingdom is yours. Janaka, Venerable One, I offer myself and my kingdom in your service. The children of Prajapati, the Creator, gods, human beings, and Asuras, the godless, lived with their father as students. When they had completed the allotted period, the god said, Venerable one, please teach us. Prajapati answered with one syllable, Da. Have you understood, he asked. Yes, they said. You have told us, Damyata, be self-controlled. You have understood, he said. Then the human beings approached, Venerable one, Please teach us. Pajapati answered with one syllable, Da. Have you understood? he asked. Yes, they said. You have told us, Data. Give. You have understood, he said. Then the godless approached, Venerable one, please teach us. Pajapati answered with the same syllable, Da. Have you understood? he asked. Yes, they said. You have told us, Dayadwam, be compassionate. 
you have understood, he said. The heavenly voice of the thunder repeats this teaching. Da, da, da. Be self-controlled. Give. Be compassionate. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The Mandukya Upanishad. Om stands for the Supreme Reality. It is a symbol for what was, what is, and what shall be. Om represents also what lies beyond past, present, and future. Brahman is all, and the Self is Brahman. This Self has four states of consciousness. The first is called Vaishvanara, in which one lives with all the senses turned outward, aware only of the external world. Taijasa is the name of the second, the dreaming state in which, with the senses turned inward, one enacts the impressions of past deeds and present desires. The third state is called Pratnya, of deep sleep, in which one neither dreams nor desires. There is no mind in Pratnya. There is no separateness. But the sleeper is not conscious of this. Let him become conscious in Pratnya, and it will open the door to the state of abiding joy. Pratnya, all-powerful and all-knowing, dwells in the hearts of all as the ruler. Pretnya is the source and end of all. The fourth is the superconscious state called Turiya, neither inward nor outward, beyond the senses and the intellect, in which there is none other than the Lord. He is the supreme goal of life. He is infinite peace and love. Realize Him. Turiya is represented by Om. Though indivisible, it has three sounds. A stands for Vaisvanara. Those who know this, through mastery of the senses, obtain the fruit of their desires and attain greatness. U indicates Taijasa. Those who know this, by mastering even their dreams, become established in wisdom. In their family, everyone leads the spiritual life. M corresponds to pratnya. Those who know this, by stilling the mind, find their true stature and inspire everyone around to grow. The mantra Om stands for the supreme state of Turiya without parts, beyond birth and death, symbol of everlasting joy. Those who know Om as the Self become the Self. Truly, they become the Self. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The Kina Upanishad The student inquires, Who makes my mind think? Who fills my body with vitality? Who causes my tongue to speak? Who is that invisible one who sees through my eyes and hears through my ears? The teacher replies, The self is the ear of the ear, the eye of the eye, the mind of the mind, the word of words, and the life of life. Rising above the senses and the mind, and renouncing separate existence, the wise realize the deathless self. Him our eyes cannot see, nor words express. He cannot be grasped even by the mind, we do not know, we cannot understand, because he is different from the known, and he is different from the unknown. Thus have we heard from the illumined ones. That which makes the tongue speak, but cannot be spoken by the tongue, know that as the self. This self is not someone other than you. That which makes the mind think, but cannot be thought by the mind, that is the self indeed. This self is not someone other than you. That which makes the eye see, but cannot be seen by the eye, that is the self indeed. This self is not someone other than you. 
that which makes the ear hear but cannot be heard by the ear, that is the self indeed. This self is not someone other than you. That which makes you draw breath but cannot be drawn by your breath, that is the self indeed. This self is not someone other than you. If you think, I know the self, you know not. All you can see is his external form. Continue, therefore, your meditation. The student. I do not think I know the self, nor can I say I know him not. The teacher. There is only one way to know the self, and that is to realize him yourself. The ignorant think the self can be known by the intellect, but the illumined know he is beyond the duality of the knower and the known. The self is realized in a higher state of consciousness when you have broken through the wrong identification that you are the body subject to birth and death. To be the self is to go beyond death. Realize the self, the shining goal of life. If you do not, there is only darkness. See the self in all and go beyond death. Once upon a time, the gods defeated the demons, and though the victory was brought about through the power of Brahman, the gods boasted, Ours is the victory, and ours the power and glory. Brahman saw their foolish pride and appeared before them, but they recognized him not. They said to Agni, god of fire, Find out who this mysterious being is. I will, promised Agni, and he approached the being. Who are you? asked the mysterious one. I am Agni, god of fire, known to all. Are you powerful? I can burn all on earth. Burn this, and Brahman placed a straw in front. The god of fire attacked the straw, but failed to burn it. Then he ran back to the gods and confessed, I have failed to discover who this mysterious being is. They said to Vayu, god of air, Find out who this mysterious being is. I will, promised Vayu, and approached the being. Who are you? asked the mysterious one. I am Vayu, god of air, king of space. Are you powerful? I can blow all the way. Blow this away. Brahman placed a straw in front. The god of air attacked the straw, but failed to move it. Then he ran back to the gods and confessed, I have failed to discover who this mysterious being is. They begged Indra, leader of gods, find out who this mysterious being is. I will, promised Indra, and approached the being, who disappeared instantly. In his place appeared the lovely goddess of wisdom, Uma, daughter of the Himalayas. And Indra asked her, Who was that being? Uma replied, That was Brahman, from whom comes all your power and glory. The gods realized at last, The self is Brahman, Agni, Vayu, Indra. These three excel among the gods because they realized Brahman. The light of Brahman flashes in lightning. The light of Brahman flashes in our eyes. It is the power of Brahman that makes the mind to think, desire, and will. Therefore, use this power to meditate on Brahman. He is the inmost self of everyone. He alone is worthy of all our love. Meditate upon him in all. Those who meditate upon him are dear to all. The student. Teach me more of this spiritual wisdom, the teacher. I shall share with you fully what I know. Meditation, control of the senses and passions, and selfless service of all are the body, the scriptures are the limbs, and truth is the heart of this wisdom. Those who realize Brahman shall conquer all evil and attain the supreme state Truly, they shall attain the supreme state. Om Shanti 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 The Kata Upanishad 
Once long ago, Vaja Shravasa gave away his possessions to gain religious merit. He had a son named Nachiketa, who, though only a boy, was full of faith in the scriptures. Nachiketa thought, when the offerings were made, what merit can one obtain by giving away cows that are too old to give milk? To help his father understand this, Nachiketa said, To whom will you offer me? He asked this again and again. To death I give you, said his father in anger. The son thought, I go, the first of many who will die, in the midst of many who are dying, on a mission to Yama, king of death. See how it was with those who came before, how it will be with those who are living. Like corn, mortals ripen and fall. Like corn, they come up again. Nachiketa went to Yama's abode, but the king of death was not there. He waited three days. When Yama returned, he heard a voice say, When a spiritual guest enters the house, like a bright flame he must be received well, with water to wash his feet. Far from wise are those who are not hospitable to such a guest. They will lose all their hopes, the religious merit they have acquired, their sons and their cattle. Yama, O oh spiritual guest, I grant you three boons to atone for the three inhospitable nights you have spent in my abode. Ask for three boons, one for each night. Nachiketa, O oh king of death, as the first of these boons, grant that my father's anger be appeased so that he may recognize me when I return and receive me with love. Yama, I grant that your father, the son of Udalaka and Aruna, will love you as in the past. When he sees you released from the jaws of death, he will sleep again with a mind at peace. Nachiketa, there is no fear at all in heaven, for you are not there, neither old age nor death. Passing beyond hunger and thirst and pain, all rejoice in the kingdom of heaven. You know the fire sacrifice that leads to heaven, O king of death. I have full faith in you and ask for instruction. Let this be your second boon to me. Yama, yes, I do know Nachiketa, and shall teach you the fire sacrifice that leads to heaven and sustains the world, that knowledge concealed in the heart. Now listen. Then the king of death taught Nachiketa how to perform the fire sacrifice, how to erect the altar for worshipping the fire from which the universe evolves. When the boy repeated his instruction, the dread king of death was well pleased and said, Let me give you a special boon. This sacrifice shall be called by your name, Nachiquita. Accept from me this many-hued chain, too. Those who have thrice performed this sacrifice realized their unity with father, mother, and teacher, and discharged the three duties of studying the scriptures, ritual worship, and giving alms to those in need, rise above birth and death. Knowing the god of fire born of Brahman, they attain perfect peace. Those who carry out this triple duty conscious of its full meaning will shake off the dread noose of death and transcend sorrow to enjoy the world of heaven. Thus have I granted you the second boon, Nachiquita, the secret of the fire that leads to heaven. It will have your name. Ask now, Nachiquita, for the third boon. Nachiquita, when a person dies, there arises this doubt. He still exists, say some. He does not, say others. I want you to teach me the truth. This is my third boon. Yama. This doubt haunted even the gods of old, for the secret of death is hard to know. Ask for some other boon and release me from my promise. Nachiquita. This doubt haunted even the gods of old, for it is hard to know, O death, as you say. 
I can have no greater teacher than you, and there is no boon equal to this. Yama, ask for sons and grandsons who will live a hundred years. Ask for herds of cattle, elephants and horses, gold and vast land, and ask to live as long as you desire, or, if you can think of anything more desirable, ask for that, with wealth and long life as well. Nachikita, be the ruler of a great kingdom and I will give you the utmost capacity to enjoy the pleasures of life. Ask for beautiful women of loveliness, rarely seen on earth, riding in chariots, skilled in music, to attend on you. But, Nachikita, don't ask me about the secret of death. Nachikita, these pleasures last but until tomorrow, and they wear out the vital powers of life. How fleeting is all life on earth. Therefore, keep your horses and chariots, dancing and music for yourself. Never can mortals be made happy by wealth. How can we be desirous of wealth when we see your face and know we cannot live while you are here? This is the boon I choose and ask you for. Having approached an immortal like you, how can I, subject to old age and death, ever try to rejoice in a long life for the sake of the senses fleeting pleasures dispel this doubt of mine O king of death does a person live after death or does he not Nachiketa asks for no other boon than the secret of this great mystery having tested young Nachiketa and found him fit to receive spiritual instruction Yama king of death said the joy of the Atman ever abides, but not what seems pleasant to the senses. Both these, differing in their purpose, prompt man to action. All is well for those who choose the joy of the Atman, but they miss the goal of life who prefer the pleasant. Perennial joy or passing pleasure, this is the choice one is to make always. The wise recognize these two, but not the ignorant. The first welcome what leads to abiding joy, though painful at the time. The latter run, goaded by their senses, after what seems immediate pleasure. Well have you renounced these passing pleasures so dear to the senses, Nachiquita, and turned your back on the way of the world which makes mankind forget the goal of life. Far apart are wisdom and ignorance. The first leads one to self-realization. The second makes one more and more estranged from his real self. I regard you, Nachiketa, worthy of instruction, for passing pleasures tempt you not at all. Ignorant of their ignorance, yet wise in their own esteem, these deluded men, proud of their vain learning, go round and round like the blind led by the blind. Far beyond their eyes, hypnotized by the world of sense, opens the way to immortality. I am my body. When my body dies, I die. Living in this superstition, they fall life after life under my sway. It is but few who hear about the self. Fewer still dedicate their lives to its realization. Wonderful is the one who speaks about the self. Rare are they who make it the supreme goal of their lives. Blessed are they who through an illumined teacher, attain to self-realization. The truth of the self cannot come through one who has not realized that he is the self. The intellect cannot reveal the self beyond its duality of subject and object. They who see themselves in all and all in them help others through spiritual osmosis to realize the self themselves. This awakening, you have known, comes not through logic and scholarship, but from close association with a realized teacher. Wise are you, Nachikita, because you seek the self eternal. May we have more seekers like you. Nachikita, I know that earthly treasures are transient, and never can I reach the eternal through them. Hence have I renounced all my desires for earthly treasures to win the eternal through your instruction. 
Yama. I spread before your eyes, Nachiketa, the fulfillment of all worldly desires, power to dominate the earth, delight celestial gain through religious rites, miraculous powers beyond time and space. These, with will and wisdom, have you renounced. The wise, realizing through meditation the timeless self beyond all perception, hidden in the cave of the heart, leave pain and pleasure far behind. Those who know they are neither body nor mind, but the immemorial self, the divine principle of existence, find the source of all joy and live in joy abiding. I see the gates of joy are opening for you, Nachiketa. <laughs> 